Hi, I'm Shannon McKinnon. I'm the Director of Career Development and Work Integrated Learning here at Emily Carr. Um, and uh, we are tonight, we are doing a panel here called the Alumni Career Pathway Series here on campus. And our campus is situated on the, here, I was giving you a hard time, Colin, <laughs> uh, which is situated on the unceded traditional ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And um, yeah, I'm gonna tell you a little bit uh, about this, the series. So our Alumni Career Pathway Series is an annual three-part series brought to you, brought to us by RBC and is presented by Alumni Relations in collaboration with the Shumka Center and uh, our office, uh, Career Development and Work Integrated Learning. And it's, uh, a, it's a host uh, of alumni panelists and a moderator, so also even our moderator is an alumni. Uh, and they talk to demystify career paths for current ECU students. I also would encourage you, if you can, to sign up here using this QR, or there's one on the back table there for those of you that are here in person, and you could win an Opus gift card if you sign up using that QR code. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm gonna pass it over to Alan, and Alan can introduce himself, who's an alumni, and the rest of the panelists. Thanks so much. Hi, how is everybody today? Got some awesome looking snacks, I see. Very jealous of your snacks. Um, so my name is Alan. Uh, I am the industry liaison for research here at Emily Carr. Um, uh, my role is, is somewhat even foggy to me, uh, but what I essentially do is I bring uh, partners together that want to work with our research department that is upstairs on the fourth floor. So I facilitate all kinds of relationships and partnership development and help and work with people like Jem Ray and Shannon and Ashley to try to make different and various things happen within the school. So I'm honored to be asked to be part of this panel and with a, such an awesome and distinguished group. So maybe what I'll do is start from left and go to right. And on my left is Gabrielle Burke. And Gabrielle uh, graduated in 2011 and um, I'm going to read her bio, but because um, I haven't memorized it. <laughs> so Gabrielle first found Clay in 2004, where she explored the medium of self-directed practice. She graduated from Emily Carr University of Art and Design in 2011, as we mentioned, focusing mainly in clay. She founded Community Clay, formerly G Ceramic & Co., as she was enamored by the way ceramic objects inhabit our daily lives and wanted to provide the opportunity for others to further their ceramic explorations and connection to clay. Awesome. Her personal practice draws inspiration from the functionality of making and the material self. She explores the boundaries of the medium and contrasts the simplicity of the material. So, beautifully written. Um, and now I'm going to go to Eric, and Eric has got a smaller bio, but I'm sure he's accomplished a lot. I talk more too. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Eric is an environmental artist and educator. Um, he graduated in 2022, That's right. so pretty recently. Born on Vancouver Island of settler descent, he received his training as an ecologist from UVic and as an artist from Emily Carr University. His art and ideas are published in Canadian art magazine and in scientific spaces, such as the Salish Sea Ecosystem Conference. Very cool. So you've really married science and art. That's, that's, that's right. neat. Yeah. OK, and, and Alex Hill on, the, on our immediate right, on his immediate right, is an Indonesian Canadian illustrator. She graduated from Emily Carr University in design in 2020. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, with a BFA in illustration where she explored children's book, illustration, animation, and concept art. She is currently working as a designer for TV animation in Vancouver, the heart of Canada's film and television industry. Woot woot. Uh, much of her personal work is born from the love of her Indonesian heritage. Her other passions include 
I hope I'm getting this right. Her herbitology? herbitology. Is this study of reptiles? Oh, very interesting. And mycology. So if anyone is in need of some reptile or fungi facts to brighten up their day, she's got you covered. Awesome. Okay. That's a great bio, Alex. So um, all of you are, are similar, but all very different. I mean, you all went to this university. You all um, managed to make it through this place and with flying colors. And now you're in the, the big bad world doing stuff. I mean, um, I don't know where to start. Maybe, um, uh, maybe we can start with Gabrielle, because we were talking a little bit we had a chance to get to know each other a little bit before the whole session started. And Gabrielle's really married her art practice with her business acumen, and now she's sort of going in both directions. And was this what you imagined when you were going to school here? Honestly, I don't even know what I imagined when <laughs> I was going to school. Um, if I'm really honest, I feel like the company and the studio has taken me for a ride. Mm. And I started out, when I graduated, I was working as a product designer for a home decor company. And I was flying around the world, setting up showrooms and doing product development with factories. And then I realized that anyone could do my job. Well, most, some, a lot of people could do my job. And I had spent a lot of time working on my practice, developing, developing my practice, learning from amazing people. And there wasn't really much of a ceramic community in Vancouver at that time. And like Robin Hopper passed away and people were getting sick. Mm. And I kind of thought that it, something needed to happen. So I quit my job and I... Oh, you had, you had a, a full-time job. Mm -hmm. What were you doing at that moment? Product design. Product design, okay, and was that for like a big company? Um, they're like, a, they're based in Surrey. Um, they would go to like the World Trade Market in Vegas and stuff for like right. furniture and um, I wouldn't say they're like huge, but. But you were getting paid well. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> they definitely took advantage of the fact that I was a recently graduated student. Right. When I first got hired, I was getting paid $15 an hour. Oh my gosh, wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And then I realized what was happening, and I, I told them I was going to quit. And then they're like, sure, we'll pay you $25 an hour. Mm. Um, but then they didn't pay me any overtime, and I was working. Like, I was on 52 flights in one year. Oh, my gosh. And so I was just like, this isn't, this isn't, there's a glass ceiling here, and I'm being held back and not listened to, um, even though, like, the things I was making were the top sellers in the company. And so I decided to put my time into creating opportunities within the ceramic community and I started I started serving and had a little studio and my goal initially was to create approachable tableware because it didn't really exist mm. and then that happened and I was going to Toronto and doing lots of shows and stuff and selling my work in stores and eventually I was I realized that um, there wasn't any studios that people could make in and learn from and so that's when I started doing a little bit of teaching and that's really when it started to like kind of take off yeah um and so the studio's grown from 170 square foot room to well it started in my living room in White Rock <laughs> um but then yeah 170 square foot little tiny studio I teach six students at a time to oh now we have on paper uh 4,000 square feet and how many students are you teaching? Um, so we run somewhere between like eight to 11 classes per session. Wow. Wow. So there's a lot of people coming through the space. And yeah. it's really incredible. It's like I get goosebumps just thinking about it and the just seeing people develop their practice and starting from no knowledge whatsoever and then just letting that grow is really inspirational for me as a teacher mm. as well. And... It just kind of does its own thing. So did I have an understanding of what I wanted it to be? No, I just think that as artists, like a part of what we do is inspiring people. Hmm. And so that's kind of been my tune. Inspire people, okay. That's a good, th that's a good takeaway. Um, 
Alex, can you build on that? Your your work is very interesting. It's very playful. From what I've, you know, I did a little bit of snooping, you know, around. snooping around on your website, and and you know, you really got some beautiful work there. Thank um, you. Can you tell us more about it and, and you know the motivation for it? And maybe is this what you imagine where you are today doing? Yeah, so I was going to say I have a very different answer. I wanted to work in animation ever since I can remember, like ever since I started watching cartoons. Um, first thing I would do when I got home from school would be to go watch cartoons on Nickelodeon or Cartoon Network. Um, my favorite shows were Avatar, Last Airbender, and that was really a driving force. I would always wait um, until they had the after show specials to show the making of and behind the scenes. And I would always watch those extras on like Disney DVDs um, showing how uh, animated films were made. Um, so I went into Emily Carr. I, I chose to go to school in Vancouver because I knew Vancouver was a hub for uh, animation. And I just, I didn't really want to live in the States particularly. Um, so. Vancouver and Emily Carr were my first choice, and I would say the major thing that was a different journey for me than a lot of other um, people working in animation is I didn't go for an animation major. I specifically chose illustration because I hate animating. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's not that uncommon of a path in animation, but it's definitely like a little unconventional. Um, and yes, but my main drive for me is because of shows like Avatar Last Airbender that really allowed people working on that show to um, show their culture to the world. One of my driving factors is bringing my Indonesian heritage to the forefront of animation. I just want to keep um, pushing for Indonesian, but also just Southeast Asian or Asian stories in general. And I think that's a huge driver of my personal work as well as my as professional work as much as I can sneak it in there um, because I, it is a very it is a very um, rigid industry you are working with clients like Netflix and um, working with executives a lot who are not really artists themselves but you can kind of sneak in your personal touch here and there whenever you can mm. so how oh. Well, let's put a pin in that. That's a really good thought, but I want to make sure we get Eric in here too because we're sort of trying to introduce you. Well, I'm trying to introduce you to all the folks and then we can circle back on that point. Eric, t tell us about you. I mean, you, you have a real interesting journey. You've been both ends of the, the, uh, the fulcrum in terms of science and art. Yeah, I, I mean, I think maybe a little bit different than the other panelists. I, I feel like my trajectory has always been very non-linear and, um, and probably will continue to be very non-linear. Um, so yeah, my, I, I started, like I did my first degree in, in biology and science um, and uh, don't regret a, a minute of it. I really, I still feel like that's a big part of, of who I am in my practice. And after graduating, um, I really felt like I wanted to engage with um, a different kind of person, the same concepts, the same themes around environmental um, engagement and activism and ecology, things that are very deeply connected to who I am. Um, and it felt like art and, um, and, and making was something I wanted to explore. And so... Throughout my, my time at Emily Carr, I, I really, um, uh, not consciously, but I think unconsciously, was drawing on a lot of those um, kind of ecological themes and concepts. Um, and kind of thinking about where I'm at now, it's still, it's still this kind of weird um, mix and muddle of those things. Um, my, my practice... For, um, I guess I would think of myself as interdisciplinary, um, mostly visual art, and um, I do a lot of uh, painting and printmaking, and um, a lot of it has been driven by kind of material practice and sustainable material practice, um, but it, it's, I, I don't know if it's a personal personality flaw, but I find myself bouncing around a lot between different uh, medium uh, media and uh, and just trying to think about like what is going to be the 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 mode that's going to engage people in in a certain idea or a certain thing I'm feeling or thinking about. Right. 
That's interesting. I mean, I think um, there's a real tradition of science and art uh, uh, meeting. You know, we have the, the project that Randy Lee Cutler was running with uh, uh, Ingrid Koning and uh, about leaning windows, about physics and art, and that, that's a, the, the intersections are, are, are there and, and very interesting to explore. Well, um, let's um, delve into some other stuff. Like, so you, let's go back to Gabrielle. Like, you were telling me you've got this crazy thing going on with all these people in your studio. You've got this space that, you know, you've got to account for every, every month. How is it that you um, have time to carve out any creative time for you? And because that's, in the end, what you want to be doing, right? I would assume. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Totally. Um, so it was really funny thinking about that. And uh, how do you find time for your practice while you're working? Because I work in my field. But is my practice my work? Um, <laughs> Yes, no, but I still have projects that I've been thinking about for like 17 years that I have not done. So um, they're actually happening now. They're starting to happen. Um, it's, it's really interesting because as you mature and get older and, you know, you live longer, your inspiration changes and how you view practice, your practice changes but there's always themes I feel like that kind of stick to your bones a bit um, and so it's when I think about like what my job is or like what the company is now or I don't like referring to it as a company because it just feels like it's a corporate thing but it's not like I don't, that's the structure though yeah, that, yeah the studio I refer to it the as studio. a studio that's good um, a lot of like what I draw inspiration from now actually comes from there and from the space and from like my students will ask me like oh can we do this in this class today because we don't have curriculum for like intermediate classes we just show them whatever they want to learn mm. and they'll ask me to do something I haven't made in 10 years and so it like comes back around and then you start thinking about it again and it gets in your head and percolates and then these things come back around but it's really challenging to find time for practice for your practice if your practice isn't your job, even if you work in the same industry. If it might be even harder because you're in the space and you take it for granted. And there was a period of like, like I actually don't feel like I worked on my artistic practice since I graduated up until like a couple years ago. Wow. Um, but there's things that are happening now, like mm, like I said, I had ideas for like 12 years and I started making them about three years ago. But I haven't really started talking about it yet. Mm. So they're they're come they're coming into shape, uh, but slowly. Right. I, I this is um this is sort of a very self serving question because I I was thinking about my own uh, journey, but um, how did the pandemic change your desire as an artist to make stuff? Like I know for me, and and I'm obviously quite a bit older than all of you. But it was sort of like I, I went, oh, there's a finite amount of time in this world that I'm in. And I really want to do some stuff. Like, were you thinking along those lines? Or did you feel differently about your creative? Anybody can take this question. I'm sort of curious. Um, well, having graduated the year the pandemic began, and this was the very classroom where they told us, like, oh, you're not coming back to class next week. School is done. Um, that was, uh, that really, at first obstructed my creative process a lot because we were working on final projects in fourth year and we ha kind of had this, like, we kind of lost all our steam. We just felt like, what's the point? Why continue? Um, but after, after we officially graduated, I mean, we did graduate, but it just kind of felt like we didn't because we never really had our show and we never really, most of us did not finish our projects. But after taking some time sitting, we had like, two weeks to, and I got laid off from my regular job. Um, so I had a couple months to just sit with myself and my art. And um, it ended up being one of the best times of growth for my art ever. 
in my life because I've never really had a time to just sit with my art and not work and worry about working and just have all day long to create. Um, and so that was a huge turning point for my work and I really just focused on things that I truly wanted to make um, separate from moving away from school assignments or thinking about like building my portfolio for the industry because I, I really didn't think I would be getting a job anytime soon. So I was just making things that I truly wanted to make and I think it was kind of a much needed break for myself after having been basically grinding for four years at art school and um, it was it was a great time for of growth for me basically I, I look I strangely look back on those days fondly even though there was a lot of suffering going on in the world it was it was something that I really needed so you felt free yeah mm -hmm. and now I'm back in animation industry and I do not have that freedom anymore and I envy my past self a little bit <laughs> um, but yeah, luckily in this industry, there's uh, it's all contract work, so you do have plenty of time to take breaks. I just haven't taken one yet since I've graduated, so hmm. I need to do that. Eric, do you, do you have anything you want to add to that? Um, sure, yeah. I, I feel like maybe similarly, I think when things kind of like, when life got a lot smaller for those first few months or years, I guess, um, uh, I think my practice also got a lot more personal and a lot more, um, I think I approached my creative process a lot more holistically, um, thinking about things that mattered to me outside of a kind of like art space or kind of like formal art space. And I think that really did actually shift um, my relationship to art and I think um, if I could sum it up, it would probably be something more like I, I shifted from really hyper-focusing on the kind of end product or the kind of like thing I was making and a lot more practice and process-based. Um, and also for me personally, that was also about connecting with land and nature and thinking about um, that as a big part of my art process. And so I think those are things that have stuck, um, you know, have become in integral to my, to my practice. But... It, it was born out of a, a kind of stripping away of the lot of, of the kind of artifice or kind of public um, facing things that I was projecting about what my art needed to be. So it became, um, yeah, it, it, it became personal out of necessity, and I think it's it's stayed um, in that space more um, even now that things have opened up a little bit more. Mm. Interesting. Um, so, I'm kind of interested about about some of the challenges that you all face as as artists, like, um, and 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 also practitioners and entrepreneurs. So, I mean, what what is what is the biggest hill for you right now that you, when you wake, when you go to bed at night, and you try to close your eyes and go to sleep. Um, what do you think about? And then what's the first thing that wakes you up in the morning? Oh, I got to do this. Emails. <laughs> <laughs> every, every time. Uh, wait, what was the question? <laughs> well, so what, what, what are, what's, what's causing you worry? And what, what do you wake up with? What worries do you wake up with as an artist? Like, how do you face the day and all the challenges that you have to get through in that day? Like... Like, are, are you, are you, or you don't think about it like that? Maybe you don't. It's really interesting because, like, um, I think one of the things I think about now, and I don't know, I haven't really talked about this lately, but, like, when I went to Emily Carr and when I started learning ceramics, YouTube didn't exist. <laughs> um, and yeah. Instagram didn't exist and TikTok didn't exist. And I built my practice, my studio, everything that I have now based off of social media, leaning into social media, trying to sell my plates, you know, like, and then because I put it all the way out there, people started making it, you know what I mean? And so it was really interesting for me because I didn't want to be like, exploring social media myself because I didn't want to be influenced by other artists because I didn't want to like 
subconsciously like Channel, plagiarize yeah. or like whatever. Um, but then to like have that th like thrown back at me and have like my work like directly copied and like go on means there's a store in Main Street that like has work that is like almost exact replicas of mine. Ooh. Um, and but then like realizing that the reason why I wanted to make that work in the beginning was because I wanted to create approachable tableware for people and letting go of that and then realizing that that did served its purpose and then moving on and like completely I'm really grateful for it actually um, and pivoting completely and now working on s things that are much more um, introspective for me about the medium so I think like for me the biggest thing that I am wary of I wouldn't say like worry about but it's something that I'm aware of is wanting my practice to be really inspired by my authentic self and uh, like topics, themes that are really true to me and I feel very strongly about versus, oh, I saw it on Instagram, it looks kind of cool, mm -hmm. which I think, I don't know, maybe it's different here, but I think it happens a lot these days. <laughs> That's an interesting answer. I, you know, we, we didn't, when we we're practitioners of, of making things, I, I, it's not something I ever had to face, but I can see how it's a problem. That's really interesting. How about you, Eric? What, what, what kind of, what keeps you up at night? What keeps me up at night? Yeah. Do you want the real answer? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I'll, I'm I'll, not sure. I'll answer that in the context of, uh, <laughs> of, of my, my art practice. I think, um, maybe similarly, I think f striking the right balance of how much energy I want to channel into my personal creative pursuits and exploration versus how much uh, energy I want to um, turn into uh, a, pr a professional, a commercial, not commercial in the sense of like a commodity, but in terms of my my financial viability as an artist and um, deciding how much of my creative energy I put into one or the other is something that um, I, cont I continually am and kind of reflecting on. Uh, and I think um, that can be really hard to um, be in tune with, especially when there is a lot of pressure to have an outward focus and a, and a, a kind of... Um, you know, for other people to see your work and value it in that way, and it and it becomes a you know those questions of identity and how how are you professionalizing yourself? Um, and I think for me, yeah, just fig figuring out what's a balance, what's sustainable, and what, um, yeah, why I'm in it uh, is is kind of a constant, um, yeah, struggle. Right. I, I think for me, it's really um, imposter syndrome in the industry <laughs> and um, sort of like just doom scrolling on Instagram or ArtStation and looking at these amazing artists and just kind of block, conveniently blocking out the fact that they've been working in the industry for like 40 years and they have 40 years ahead of me and yet I'm still comparing myself to them and making myself feel awful like all night long. And it's just a really damaging cycle, but I think we all go through it. And I think just recognizing that the more skilled you become as an artist, the more your tastes also improve and your tastes are always ahead of your skills usually. And, and that's totally okay. And just recognizing the fact that in, this, in, in the animation industry, there's all sorts of people working with all sorts of different art styles at different skill levels, different experience levels, um, different specialties, and everyone is equally as important. Um, animation, an, a production is made up of a huge team of people, and while, while there may be some people with like more skill than you, you're just as important as they are because it takes everyone to come together. And there's just really no point in comparison. Um, and yet, I don't really have a solution to stop myself from doing that. Um, it's just something that like eats me up at night all the time. So it's like the first thing I think about when I wake up. Um, 
with the Spider-Verse movie having come out and you know, so many great 2.5D animated films. 2.5D is like when you merge 2D and 3D together. Um, some amazing films have been coming out recently and I buy all the art books for all of them and then I just stare at them in despair, like what is, why can't I be like this? Um, but I think it's just about finding a balance and recognizing that you'll get there one day. I mean, you don't know what these people have gone through to get where they are now and everyone is just at a different part of their journey and it's all fine and it's all good and you don't have to hate yourself. <laughs> Um, I just want to unpack one of the things you said there, which is really it's your, your tastes are ahead of your skills. I think so, yeah. yeah. Can you tell us more about what you mean by that? I think just as you grow as an artist, um, your, your interests in art and like part of your skill as an artist is parsing out good art or like what you like in art or what you want to achieve in art. And I think that I mean, it's like setting a goal for yourself when you when you see an, an artwork or an artist that you really like. And I just think that um, part of improving as an artist is just kind of, you're always kind of like chasing after um, your taste. I don't know how to really explain it, but it's just, I, I feel like the things that I like in art, I'm striving for, but I'm not quite there myself. And then by the time I get to that point and I have this pivotal moment where I realize I learn how to do that thing that I've been striving to learn how to do, I start liking another thing that's even more complicated to learn how to do, like on a technical level. Right. And I just, you, it just keeps going. It, it really is an internal, eternal struggle for artists, I think. And I think we can all kind of relate to that. So it's almost like your your brain is saying, well, I, I conceive of this, mm -hmm. I think of this, mm -hmm. but I don't know if my hands can actually yeah. do this thing. And I yet. think that even the the artist that you admire most, the best, the best artist ever, still feels that way. Mm. Like masters felt that way about their own work, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just part of being an artist. Mm. It's very interesting. Mm. I mean, you guys are all successfully navigating the world, um, you're in it, um, you're, you're, you're making a living doing this thing. I mean, it, that in itself is an accomplishment. You should be all really proud of that. Um, uh, you know, did you, did, you did you think that you could do that with, the, with your skills when you were sort of training and through the academy sort of thing? Did you feel like that was achievable? Maybe, do you want to take that one? I still don't feel like it's real. <laughs> like there's moments where I go and the studio will be have like 30 people in it, all doing their own things, teachers, techs, like members making, and like I've got my own projects going on and I'll just like be walking through the studio to like the kilns or something and I'll stop and pause and just look around and it, floors me. It is incredible. Um, and like people are always say to me like, oh, you're so successful or, oh, you like, you do this big thing. And I'm like, it's not a big thing. It's just a little studio. Like there's, you know, whatever. It's just a thing. And I can, I kind of feel like it's a bit of like a boiling pot. Like when you, you don't really know what's happening around you, but then you look back on like five years ago and it's so different. But then how do you actualize that? It feels very strange. Mm. And I, I don't know if anyone else has like more realization of where they're at than I do. Like, I don't know if I'm just like in my own head too much. Um, but like, it, it doesn't feel real. Like, I yeah, feel like- I, I also feel that way. I think, I remember um, my illustration professors inviting industry professionals in, in the animation industry to talk about where they are, how they got there, kind of like exactly like this. And I was in such like awe and admiration of them and I was like, I want to be like them. And I guess that's kind of where I am now, but I don't, real, I don't feel that way. It just doesn't feel that way. Mm. And I don't know how to make it feel that way, but <laughs> yeah. Eric, do you have anything you want to add to that? Um. I don't know. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I, I think 
probably on an objective level, I'm, I'm not as, uh, as established an artist as, as these two. Um, and, but, I, but I think on the, other, on the other side of that, I think I also... Well, your practice is different. Yeah, I, and, I, and I think I, I really, um, you know, maybe this isn't the right thing to say at a career uh, event, but I also think it's important to be mindful of the way that our creative practices is a personal thing. Mm -hmm. and, and I really very strongly believe we're humans before we're employees or renters or volunteers or anything yeah. else. So I, and, and I, think, I think it's important, I, I don't just say that to cope with, you know, whatever, whatever I feel in terms of the economy or whatever. I think it's also really important for artists to, to fight for that, to like, to, to keep that front and center mm -hmm. um, and to keep the kind of creative drive um, <coughs> li like sustainable for its own its own merits um, and so I, I, I think I maybe define kind of where where I'm at a little bit differently but I also think at this at the end of the day it, it is grappling with how we how we identify um, and where where our kind of sense of of validation or or inspiration comes from mm. yeah that's interesting um, so all of you are are sort of very embedded in your own practices and 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 very much doing what you want to be doing do, do any of you have to do odd jobs on the side to like keep things, the lights on, or I don't know if any of you want to. My answer is really quick, so no, I didn't. I just, I, I just had an art director who took, um, who had a lot of faith in me after seeing my work, and she offered me a job after graduating. So that's all I have to say. <laughs> I don't have so you, much of a story. So your art, well, let's look at that. Like, so your art director is someone who works on a series of projects and then says, oh, um, uh, Alex would be great for this role. Is that how it Basically, works? Basically, yeah. So um, I, I've uh, always been putting my work out there on Instagram, on Twitter, whatever. And um, my first job was working for Barbie. Um, the Barbie Netflix, not the movie. The movie was really cool, I wish. But uh, mm. the Barbie Netflix animated TV shows and um, an art director... I, I was basically really worried about job security after I got laid off from my regular job that I had while I was at school. I was just working retail and um, started looking for work immediately after graduating. And I just, there was not a lot of hiring at that moment, but I just submitted what's called a application, expression of interest application. And um, my work just kind of got circled around uh, the studio, Mainframe Studios to be exact, and an art director saw my work and was like, we could use her, and offered me a job as a junior, which is better than being a production assistant, which is usually what a lot of people have to go for initially. So I'm really fortunate in that aspect that my first job was as a junior designer, like a visual development artist in animation, rather than being a PA, which is just like grabbing coffee and stuff. So I, I, I say I don't have much of a story because I'm, I'm very fortunate in that. Um, and, it, and that doesn't come from just being lucky. Like I, I, ha I put a lot of hard work into my portfolio. So having a strong portfolio is really all that matters. I don't have the best um, interviewing skills. Like my interview wasn't really much of an interview. It was just a little chat. Um, so I think just having a really strong portfolio is really So your work really stands matters. for itself. I, I, th I would say so. <laughs> I don't want to sound too, I just, yeah, I think like a strong portfolio is really all they're looking for. It doesn't matter if you're a really shy person or anything, it's just they just want to see you be able to communicate um, your ideas strongly. Eric, do you have to do other odd jobs, things to keep uh, going? Yeah, well, yes, I mean, I have a, a job outside of my art practice, yeah. I. I um, I think at different stages um, since I've graduated, I've I've had more and less um, kind of other jobs, um, and I think that will probably can change in the future as well. Yeah. But for me, it was a matter of it was less to do with. I think it was less to do with like, I mean, there's the financial element of it, but there's also, um, like, from I don't know, maybe this is corny, but I also do think it, it has to like. It has to be a balance of knowing like what you want your practice 
to be actually. Mm. And so for me, being able to to not have um, the kind of pressure on my art practice where I where I felt like I was at um, when I when I got a, 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 another job, it was more about asking the question of like. Well, is this the, once the train track, once you're on the tracks, it can be really hard to get off. And I really wanted to, to ask that question. Uh, and I'm glad I did, yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, do you feel though that your art practice and your day job uh, learn from each other? Is there, does, do you learn things from your, 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 that, that, yeah, yeah, it, yeah for it, sure. Yeah, I actually work. Um, I work to support art and uh, design students that have like intellectual disabilities and whatnot. Oh, very cool. So for me, being around creative people, being in a, in a culture and an environment that is around creative people yeah. is super like generative and creative. Yeah, I don't think I, I still consider myself working in the art. Yeah. Space. Of course. Yeah. yeah. Um, but but to me, it's more a question of like you say. Is that is that a generative thing or is it a um, like a draw? And for me, it's not a draw. Sure. And you got it just like so. Like all these things are just the web is like tight. Yes, it is. I feel like everything I do is an odd job. Um, it's actually really interesting thinking about that question and thinking about like okay, like what is a practice? Like who are we as artists? Like what are we trying to do? Because, like, a part of being an artist is, like, you have to document your work. You have to, like, reach out to people. Like, that's ne networking PR and, you know, uh, documenting is photography. Like, there's so many different parts of it. And then having the studio, like, I've built the studio, like, by myself. I do the photography. I do the videography. I built my website. I do Google ads, all the ad things. Like, literally every single thing. I even do my own bookkeeping because it is so hard to find a bookkeeper. Whoa. So like. That's incredible. But like we do that as artists, that's what you do. Um, I feel like as artists we are resilient people um, that we just do things. Mm. We wanna do something and we just make it happen. Mm -hmm. And so like I feel that as artists, everything that we do is a part of our practice, even as humans, like cooking for instance. Like, do you just make noodles and just eat them and that's it? Or do you add something to it because you're inspired by that flavor or and the texture and the experience of eating something that's so delicious and nourishes your body? Mm. That's artistic too. I feel like that's part of your practice it's as well. It's getting close to dinner time. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so like odd jobs, I think it's like all related. That's awesome because I think... Um, you know, I very much understand that because for a lot of years, all I did was before I got into teaching and then eventually what I'm doing now is um, as an independent filmmaker, uh, you, you are your work, you are your thing. And, and you guys are very, oh, there's a lot of parallels. It's interesting. Um, if you could think about your younger selves for one minute, and put yourselves like it, it's 10 years ago or, or a little maybe, okay, it's not 10 years ago, it's, it's five or seven years ago or whatever it is, but what would you tell yourself in you know, your today self, what you were grappling with then about this decision that you had made? I mean, in your case, you were still maybe doing a different degree. Doing a different degree but, did you have it inside of yourself at that moment that you wanted to be, you still had this idea of being an artist even though you were doing a different degree? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think for me, like art has been a lifelong pursuit. I think, um, I, I agree that I think creative expression isn't something that can be kind of just cordoned into a certain part of, of your life. Um, I think if I were, to speak to a younger version of myself. I think there's like maybe there's two sides to the coin. For me, one, I really resonate with what you said about how much of uh, being a professional artist isn't um, making. Uh, it, it's bookkeeping or emailing or grant writing or um, fo you know anything, coding, what all these other things are. Um, and I think I was naive to that element of it when I started 
mm. uh, my degree. And I think there's a kind of personality that, that's able to kind of um, embrace all of those ele elements. I don't know if I'm the, I don't know if I'm the most, you know, uh, in like in touch with my creative practice when I'm doing all of those things. Um, but on the other other side of it, I think I would have maybe reassured myself that um, there's there's a, an, another route I think where where for me at least where I'm at now really like doubling down on the creative elements of it. Um, for for I don't know if anybody's listening who who doesn't who who finds it intimidating to think about some of those. Um, other business kind of oriented things. I think there's another route or version of of being an artist where, um, yeah, maybe maybe it's not as uh, I don't know. Maybe things don't move as fast, but there's a, like a, I, I've been finding lately a light touch has still been bringing opportunities, has still been bringing connections and jobs uh, and that kind of thing. Um, and and I found that kind of two sides of the same coin kind of something that's new uh, and a new realization for me. Yeah. What, um, what, would you, what would your younger self be telling yourself? Well, what would you be telling well, your younger self? Right. Yeah. Um, well, I think I would give my younger self a little bit of a warning just because um, part of being in the animation industry is losing a lot of agency over what you want to create. Mm. You don't own any of the work you make. Everything is owned by studio, Netflix, um, Mattel, whatever client you're working for. And I would, well, when I was in university, my entire life revolved around working in animation. I, that's all I wanted to do. That's all the type of work that I made. And um, my goal was, I had huge goals like, oh, I want to work at Disney and I want to do this and I want to do that. And I've really been disillusioned to that after being in the industry because I don't really define success in animation as just working on the best projects or working at the biggest studio. It's more so just success for me is like um, finding that balance between the, like you, I have to work to make money. I have to have a living. And I'm really fortunate to be a person who's making a living doing something that I love. But it's not something that I love completely because at the end of the day, it's not my own projects. And so I just would like to tell my younger self to make sure to make time for herself to just um, like delve into other things that I'm interested in. So like whether that's handcrafting enclosures for my reptiles or um, mushroom foraging or whatever it is, the other, all the other hobbies I'm interested in, like those are just as important to your artistic fulfillment. It's not all about um, the animation industry and and like grinding to get the most aspirational job you possibly can. I don't really think that's a healthy way to measure success. Mm. Um, if I came to you right now and I said, I, I you know. I really love your character art and and your stuff, and you could own it, and we could make something together. And I and um, but you'd have to quit all your jobs and all the things you're doing and take a risk. Would you do it? Maybe not in this uh, state of the economy. <laughs> I still have to pay rent. Um, but maybe, yeah. I I definitely have taken time to do other projects on top of my industry work yeah if I just I'm really passionate about it um this guy approached me because he was making uh, a tabletop board game like DND sort of and he wanted me to do character designs and he wasn't going to pay me that much and I was like you know what your idea is awesome and I just want to work on your project and so I definitely do make time for stuff that I'm really passionate about it's just I can't something that I'm trying to pursue right now is um getting into tattooing mm. and that is something that takes a lot of time and commitment and um, but I'm trying to make sure I make that time for myself um, but it is just difficult to balance um, working in animation because you've probably heard of like the animation crunch where I'm at my studio we're currently in a crunch where we just have to submit things on these really tight deadlines and I just haven't been able to make time for myself um, so I wish I could say yes 100% but it's hard sometimes. Um, so I would just like to tell my younger self, like, it's important to take breaks. Um, as I said, it's contract work, so if you can, take breaks where you can. Um, and yeah. How, how about you? What, what would you tell your younger self in this moment that, you're, that now you find yourself? 
I think I would tell myself to go travel. Mm. Um, that's like one of my biggest regrets. I went um, straight from high school to Emily Carr and I haven't ever really had a chance to travel because I like got into the grind. Um, I would also tell myself that um, I think to be kind to myself, um, we're all doing the best we can with what we've got. And I would, it's really interesting because like I, try to do for my team what I wish someone had done for me. So um, one of the things that you have when you work for me is like if there's something that you want to do, like a show, or um, you want to travel to go take a class or something, like they can talk to me about it and we can help them with funding to go do those things. Fantastic. Um, and like, so... I feel like the things that I wish I had done for myself, I am like pushing forward with, with people in the future, like now and moving forward. Um, but I think it would just be to, we're just observers here <laughs> in a human experience and to take the time to be a human mm. and to just see um, and experience what is happening around you. Right. Now, do you, now um, just, interest, just out of curiosity, do you have employees at your? You yes. do. Yeah. So you have a payroll on top of yes. all these things. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Wow. Yeah. And I mean. How many people are on this payroll? Uh, I think, like, four, four or five right now. Yeah. Right. It fluctuates depending on, like, This the is con need. a contract, though. No, they're employees. They're employees. Yeah. Wow. And, like, one of the things, like, if you work 30 hours, you get benefits, and I want to, I don't know, I want to have a good space. So I made mistakes, because, like, one of the things that I've learned is boundaries, because I've never been a boss before, and um, I, when I started hiring people, I was like, I want to make, be the best boss ever, and do everything I can to make everyone happy. That didn't work out so good. <laughs> so now I've learned the art of boundaries, and, um, like... Just, yeah, it's pretty cool. I don't know. I think life is really interesting because, like, with your practice, but also, like, I think, what was it that was said earlier? Like, uh, you are your practice. No, your practice is you. Mm. Like. That's interesting. I think. I think. Personally, that's my opinion. Well, let's just twig on that for one second. So, in your case, are you, do you have to answer to anybody with your, our practice in terms of like, are you taking funding from anywhere? Then you have to report on that funding or are you just going, I'm going to go make this thing? Um, I guess it depends. Like I, I um, if I do commission work, then I answer to the, the client that's requesting yeah. um, the work. But that's usually a really like, per, like it's um, where I'm at with the luxury of having to not pay my entire rent bill with, um, my art, it, I don't really take things that I don't want you to. Don't want to do. yeah. uh, and so that's kind of like, that's a personal kind of line for myself where I'm at right now. That would probably change if I, if I wasn't um, working a different role, in a different role. Um, but right now, all of the things that I'm, I'm doing, I'm really, really excited about. So um, that's kind of... Yeah, I guess I don't answer to anybody um, with my art practice. Um, how would yeah? You, how would you say your practice is built right now? Like, would you say, okay, so how many projects that do you have just in this moment? I think it it, it really depends how you answer that question. Like right. commissions, I'm just working on like a couple. Okay. Um, okay, and then everything else is your generate you're generating. Yeah, and and where that will end up or what that will turn into is is sort of yeah you don't probably know. something that will be clear down the line right gotcha. that makes sense i don't know i'm not trying to be overly vague i just no no uh, i'm just trying to understand what yeah. your practice looks like which is interesting yeah yeah so so a couple anchor things with the commissions and then you're building developing other things that are in process kind of thing yeah and i think like as as um i'm still involved at emily carr with them different projects and been teaching a little bit, doing workshops, doing 
kind of um, actually more like science and ecology based stuff. Um, so for me, that like keeps it interesting. Um, yeah, so it's not just making, but making and also collaborating and teaching. Yeah. Awesome. And, and, and do you answer to your art director or do you answer to a lot of people? I answer to a lot of people. <laughs> I, have a, I have a prop supervisor, an environment supervisor, and a character supervisor, and an art director. And then oh they gosh. answer to production, and they answer to Netflix, and they answer to Mattel. So your work gets really, really diluted. Oh. Um, you'll start with like a, an amazing idea for something, and then by the end of it, you're like 22 iterations in, and it's like nothing like you wanted. Um, but the nice thing is you get you have all those iterations and you know you made something um, that you're proud of at some point, hopefully, in that process. But yeah, it's a lot of people to answer to. Um, I'm, I'm, I do try to branch out more with um, freelance illustration. So I do, I've done some travel illustration. I've done children's book illustration, which has been really fulfilling. It's always something that I've wanted to do. And I have I'm in contact with a few agents. I don't really know how to go about um, dealing with an agent yet, but I'm, I hope one day to uh, create my own storybook. Hmm. So that's yeah. like a long-term goal of mine. I think that's a great goal, mm -hmm. yeah. Hmm, okay, well, um, I think, uh, open it up? yeah, I was thinking maybe we'd open it up to questions. Um, um, what's the name of your studio? It's called Community in? Clay. Uh, so there's a couple Instagrams. Um, so Community Clay Home is the production table where I was making. Um, and then Community Clay Studio is our like artists and members. And then the little secret project that I've been working on that I haven't told anyone about, sort of, is called Apash Studio. Um, so now, that you know. now you know <laughs> it's recorded. It's out there. Yeah, it's out there. Um, if anyone's curious, it's A P A I X. A P A I X. Okay. Is there an Instagram one? Yes. Yes, there is. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Are there other questions? Do you, each of you just want to say like a recent highlight that you're proud of or something you want to tell folks about? So I'm actually really excited about APASH Studio. Um, so when I graduated from Emily Carr, my grad project was uh, lighting. Um, I actually ended up making two grad projects because I tried to graduate and that didn't happen. And then I paired up with someone else. Um, so I'm really interested in lighting and ceramic installations and spaces and how it occupies space. And so I've been um, designing some lights. And mm. one just went up in the studio, actually, yesterday. I just like got on a ladder and was like, I'm doing this. And the studio was full of people who were like, what are you doing? It was really funny. Sorry, what was, the, what was the question? Just things you're excited about? Yeah, any recent highlight or anything you want to share that you maybe haven't already covered tonight? Yeah, um, I think mostly the things I've been excited about is a lot of different collaborations that I'm kind of working on or, or um, getting involved in. And, and um, one of the commissions I'm working on, I, I will, you know, Think things change in time, but there's a there's an author that I'm uh, been working with who writes about um, nature and kind of does field guides and a lot of like um, um, kind of environmental writing, but really targeted at anybody who's even remotely interested in. Um, and I'm I'm doing a commission for a, a new book about a. Um, a bird, a, a bird, a waterfowl, um, and I'm just like really excited because it's really fun to work with another person who's bringing different ideas. And there's been a few other like um, highlights around, uh, yeah, some collaborative projects that that just brings a lot of joy to me because I'm a, a social person and um, bouncing ideas off each other, especially if it's somebody with a different practice or a different kind of mode of expression. Um, yeah, I don't know. Not to make this like a, a, a 
teachable moment, but I, I feel like if, if folks can find other people that have a different medium but have similar conceptual or different things that they're passionate about, those can be really, really generative relationships. And I, I've learned just as much from those, if not more, than people who have a similar, uh, you know, practice to me. Um, I, I previously mentioned that I'm kind of slowly working my way towards uh, children's book illustration. And uh, actually around this time last year, I worked on uh, with Chickadee Magazine, um, oh, Owl wow. Kids Publishing, yeah. um, which is a really full circle moment for me because I, uh, living in Indonesia, but I have Canadian family, they would send, my grandmother would send um, all the chickadee and chirp and owl magazines to me in the mail, and I would love reading through them, and I think I still have all of them. So it was really great to get to work with them, and they specifically reached out to me because they wanted me to do a three-page um, spread in the magazine about an Indonesian folktale called Kanchil, Si Kanchil, which is the story of a little mouse deer. And it was just a really um, pivotal moment for me because I said I've always wanted to work on projects about Indonesia and Southeast Asia. And the fact that they found my work and specifically wanted to work with me was just a really important moment. And they ha they let me have free reign, basically, of like the style I wanted to do it in. and. And it was just a wonderful project to work on. So this time you didn't have like all these layers that you had to gradate yeah, through? Yeah, I have one art director, Caroline, but she's great. And, and I've, I, I continue to work with her um, sometimes on owl, owl kids projects. And she's very chill. I like working with her a lot. <laughs> <laughs> OK, uh, do we have, we have a question over here. Uh, maybe, yeah. Um, I just have a question for everyone. Um, basically, when did you start looking for work to pay your rent? And like, or are you all like the type of person that is freaking out about that your whole life <laughs> or like through art school? I was always freaking out about it. I still freak out about it <laughs> um, because being a contract worker, you typically get a six month contract. I'm really fortunate to have, I've only had year long contracts, so I've never been out of work since graduating, but it is something that's always in the back of my mind. I'm always thinking, what other skills can I hone in on? Like I used to be a dog groomer, so I'm like, okay, I can go back to dog grooming. Or I was thinking of going to farrier school, which is like horse grooming <laughs> or something. Um, so it is it is kind of something I think we all worry about. Um, uh, I don't know, does that answer your question? I think it's normal to be worried about that stuff like all the time. Even if you're a really established artist, it's just normal, I think. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I can go, I mean, I feel like, I don't know, I'm biting my, my leftist tongue. Uh, I feel like <laughs> this is not a, a you problem if anybody's f f freaking out about that. Um, you know, that's there's a lot of these things that are out of our control. Um, but uh, for me, I think, Coming from a, a science background, maybe the palette that I feel like I draw from to find work is a little bit um, bigger or more diverse. And so to me, it's it's been less about certainly freaking out just as much, but more about, you know, what what's the kind of suite of things that I will, I'm going to feel is fulfilling and pays the rent um, and balancing those things. But I, I, I was thinking about that all the way through my degree and, and, um, and found jobs and did a lot of research actually throughout my degree um, at Emily Carr. So I, I tried as much as possible to make sure that the work I was doing was, was fulfilling and um, moved my career forward. But that's, that's also, that's a strategy, but it's also not like doesn't address the underlying issues. I actually have a lot of thoughts about this. <laughs> um, so I actually left home the first time when I was 15. And I was in and out of going back home for a couple of years. And then I left for the last time when I was 18. So it was like the first week of grade 12 wow. I left. Um, it wasn't safe for me to be at home. Um, so I would skip school to work so I could pay rent. 
Um, and I actually ended up graduating on the honor roll, like doing that versus at home. I was like not doing great. And I used to stress about rent because like if my paycheck didn't come in line with like the weeks of the month and the first of the month and all that stuff. And then I started, that's when I actually started selling my ceramics was high school. Um, so some teachers came around and they, uh, they saw like a display that I had and they're like, ooh, we should buy this. Like, can we buy this? And I think I made $700 from that one sale, which is huge, like huge as like an 18 year old, just like scraping by. Sure. And for the next like a lot of years, I hustled. So like I actually, when I was in Emily car, I got into a car accident because I fell asleep driving because I was working oh three God. jobs. Whoa. Yeah. And Whoa. so I spent a long time stressing about money and like paying rent and all that stuff. But then I realized that like, I, I realized I learned how to trust myself. And like as artists, we're always changing things. We're always do, like, we're gonna work in this medium, then we're gonna work in this medium, and then we're gonna change this. Mm. So there's always money, it grows on trees. You can always find more. So trust yourself, make sure you have enough, but like don't look at your bank account every day. Stop doing that, it's just gonna stress you out. Let it go you are determined, it, you'll make it happen and trust yourself in that respect. But then on the other side of it is, is like, do you want to work in your field so that you're getting your income from what you're doing? Or do you want to, and you're gonna give all your time and your energy to working there? Maybe make a little bit less, cause like, I don't know, art, like artistic fields, do they pay a lot? If anyone knows of one, let me know. Um, or is it, a smarter choice to work in some type of like career corporate type of field and then you can have your practice on the side because you have the functionality of living. Um, and not, both are great. They're both options. It's just what do you want to do day to day? What can what is the choice that feels right. good to you? Yeah. So and that's something I talk about a lot because people often also when I'm dating they're like people end up and in life crisis, because they're like, your work means so much. My work means nothing. It's like, your work means something. We need you to do your job. Please don't quit your job. <laughs> mm. But anyways, those are my thoughts. That's interesting. Can I also add yeah. Bit? I'm just going to say this quickly. Um, if this is my leftist side talking to, if you can join a unionized studio, that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> uh. So do we have any more questions? Anyone else? Uh, on your left. Um, hi. Uh, I am an MFA student, and I do illustration. I'm an international student, so um, I don't know anyone who works in the illustration industry in this country because I'm, you know, I'm from another country. And, um, and I'm wondering how can I contact with them and, or with the agent? And also have another question is, uh, the most of the illustrator that I followed on the Instagram, on the internet, they are all based in the state. So do you think the Vancouver is a good place to develop, develop um, the personal freelance career? Yes. Who wants to take that one? I think that's kind of aimed at you, Alex. Yeah. Um, I think you can Sorry. be an illustrator from anywhere because all of my work is freelance, but there's lots of Canadian um, companies looking for freelance work all the time. I know a lot of people who work for like Lululemon um, and there's like lots of Canadian um, illustration jobs, so I wouldn't worry too much about that. Um, but in terms of, what was the beginning of your question, sorry? Um, how do you get in touch with an agent? Oh, how do I get in touch with an agent? Oh, yes. Um, so typically agents get in touch with me, but that is because I submit my work on things like 3x3 Magazine or Society of Illustrators, and I would recommend you all illustrators to do it while you're a student, because the fees are way cheaper. And um, I won the 3x3 Student Illustration Award in 2020, 2020? Um, and that really opened a lot of doorways for me in terms of finding agents, uh, agents reaching out to me and publication companies reaching out. So I really recommend you get your work out there as much as you can. There's also Spectrum if you do fantasy and sci-fi art. Um, and there is a fee, but while you're a student, it's much cheaper. So definitely look into stuff like that. And if you don't have a social media presence, um, 
unfortunately, as artists, that is something you just really have to work on. And it, it is a lot of labor to take on. Um, and also just having social media and LinkedIn. LinkedIn, unfortunately, I don't like you. It's a, such a weird social media platform, but it's so important. I've got almost all of my gigs through LinkedIn. Mm. It was just about um, how to like expose your work to like other people. Because especially like, I know social media is like a huge playing factor, but knowing like the algorithm, it changes all the time. And it's like, it's so difficult to like keep up. So it's like, how do we overcome that maybe? Or is there like any other way to like expose your work other than social media? Well, for animation and illustration, I would recommend going to things like like local things like VanCaf or Spark Animation, which is coming up. I actually wrote down, it's on November 9th to 12th. If you wanna get into animation, that's a great place. You just show your portfolio to people there. Like there, there's just a bunch of studios and studio reps and you just shove your work in their face and they have to look at it. And it's a really great way to expose your work because I also don't understand how social media works. It like, it comes and goes and the followers come and go. It's not so much about followers. Like I don't have a lot of followers. It's just, it's more so about just finding interesting places to kind of put your work. Um, and I think a lot of that really, like embrace the local stuff that we have going on in Vancouver, um, Van Calf, And we used to have this great thing called Art Breakers Illustration Fair, but it doesn't exist anymore. But just try to, find these local things. I really recommend checking out Spark if you want to work in animation. Spark animation. Yeah, it's coming up soon. They run a conference every year. Mm -hmm. Social media question over here answered. Okay, so things may have changed because things change quickly. Um, what I've noticed about, because like I think Community Clay Home has like 13,000 now, but my engagement is actually, is actually like really crappy. Um, <laughs> Because like you have to pay to access the people that follow you. So if like you're just starting out, the best thing to do is actually, I think, and it could have changed, but keep your profile not a business for as long as you can because you're actually going to end up engaging more with the people that follow you. You can always recommend, too, to have your followers um, turn on the bell notification, which will let them know when you post something. Um, and then just like keep on track of like trends. So like right now, three to five second reels are trending. So just be creative with like how can you illustrate or how can you show what's happening. Um, and then one thing I saw recently, I don't know if it works because I don't think it had the engagement that I wanted, but um, trying to find reels that are trending. So they have like the upward arrow, but are under let's say like a thousand reels that people have made. So I think that would take a lot of consistency to get good, to um, get traction with it. But that's something that I have seen a lot of like social media companies posting about. Um, but consistency is key. Uh, try to get content out there like five days a week if you can. And like right now I've been so busy at work, we haven't posted on social in three weeks. And like I know when I go back, we're probably gonna get like 10 likes on the next thing I post, which sucks because I love making, I love the videography aspect and you spend like three hours on something that's like 45 seconds and then no one sees it. <laughs> but. Wow. I'll just chip in. I feel like um, just for the sake of saying it, I think that if you are an artist who doesn't, who who's willing to let go of some of those um, like if it's if it's customers, if it's revenue that comes from like ceramics and and all of these things, like social media is a huge part of of that. But um, I yeah, I mean, follow me because it makes <laughs> me feel nice uh, and it, it gives me a sense of validation. But I haven't posted anything in I think over a year, and all of the jobs that I have now are people who reached out because they because of of something that wasn't social media related um it was some presentation i gave or um or a conversation i had with somebody who is passionate about the same things and i i really i believe it and i want to believe that that we don't need to rely on um algorithms for um 
at least a kind of work different it, it's absolutely going to depend if you're if you're a studio if or if you're uh, an illustrator or whatever you do but for me um you know if, if you're able to make quality connections with people that can really make a difference as well as like a quantity of followers or a quantity of likes or whatever i really believe that that's really old-fashioned of me i know but no, I, I, lo I love the old-fashioned because I'm old. <laughs> I'm just old. If uh, I can, sorry, if I could just add to that, I think, yeah, that's so true. I think just engaging and like, everyone talks about how important networking is and it's really important, but I think making genuine, valuable connections rather than just being, okay, here are artists that I want to network with and like check them off your list. Um, just talk to them like a person and, and feel free to DM artists that you admire and just be like, hey, I love your work. And that can just build a connection from there. Like, it doesn't have to be a transactional, like, um, I want a job from you sort of thing. Just try to build those genuine connections um, as much as you can. And I think that works even better in person, which is why I really like recommend going to things like FanCAF um, and talking to your favorite artists in person and stuff like that. Awesome. Oh, I think that... More questions? All right. More. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Of course. Uh -huh. um, I would say the two things that have really influenced my life as an artist and as an entrepreneur and as a person are you don't know what you don't know. Always understand there are things that you don't know and be seeking to understand those things. Always be learning. Always be curious. Push your boundaries. Step outside your comfort zone. Because that's where I feel like the true magic happens. The growth mindset is like really, really pertinent for your life. Um, and find a mentor. Find someone who you can talk to, who's going to give you advice, who doesn't even have to be the same industry. It can be a different industry. But find someone who's living the life or doing the practice or doing the things you want to do and talk to them. And... Like I got rejected from like someone that I asked to like have a conversation with and now we're like peers, which is really funny. Um, so just like persist, don't give up. Like it's out there. You're gonna do all the things you wanna do if you don't give up. Well, that, you have, you have another I question? Have one more. Um, for like speaking of the local communities, I know you mentioned that Van Calf and Spark is like for illustrators and animators, but how about like other art fields as well, like ceramics or print media or something? I ceramics or print media would be more your area. So I've actually been thinking about this a lot lately. Um, so. There's different places you can do small shows. There's different like little galleries in the city. There's lots of little things. So do some Google searching. There's a lot of resources that are probably coming to you being here. Um, just yeah, yeah, and like go to shows. Do the crawl. Like anytime you see a show at a local gallery, go to that. Talk to people. Um, what is your practice based out of? It's funny, actually. It's all like illustration, print media, and ceramics. OK. That's why I came here. Oh, hilarious. Oh, wow. Perfect. <laughs> the um, So for ceramics, it depends on like which aspect you're looking at it. Like, are you doing tableware functional pieces? Are you looking at design? Are you looking at like installation art pieces? I think the second one. Uh, design. Yes. Design. OK, so start going to interior design shows, like start like looking up different ways that design pieces are being shown and see what opportunities are there. So most magazines will have applications to exhibit at the back. Um, and if you look up like, uh, yeah, basically that, just start looking for ways to show your work. And I think the Surrey Art Gallery is pretty accessible to local artists, but they're booking five years out. Wow. So, and it's funny because like, 10 years ago, I had an idea, and I was like, oh, five years is so long from now. Like, I'm never going to have the same idea when that time comes around, and it's 10 years, and I still have that idea, and I didn't apply. So, like, just do it. Just make it happen. Well, I, I want to give everyone um, a round of applause, and, and I'm thinking that um, if we have questions after that, you guys are going to stick around for a little bit, right? So you can have some one-on-one -on -one time with them as well. So I wanted to thank Alex, I want to thank Eric, and I want to thank Gabrielle. You guys have been terrific, and I really wish you all good luck with what you're doing. It's, it 
truly was amazing to be a part of this. Thank you. Thank you so much.